The adventure off. It must have been close on to one o'clock when we got below the island at last, and the raft did seem to go mighty slow. If a boat was to come along we was going to take to the canoe and break for the Illinois shore, and it was well a boat didn't come, for we had never thought to put the gun in the canoe, or a fishing line, or anything to eat. We was in rather too much of a sweat to think of so many things. It weren't good judgment to put everything on the raft. If the men went to the island I just expect they found the campfire I built, and watched it all night for Jim to come. Anyways, they stayed away from us, and if my building the fire never fooled them it weren't no fault of mine. I played it as low down on them as I could. When the first streak of day began to show we tied up to a towhead and a big bend on the Illinois side, and hacked off cottonwood branches with a hatchet, and covered up the raft with them so she looked like there had been a cave-in in the bank there. A towhead is a sandbar that has cottonwoods on it as thick as harrow teeth. We had mountains on the Missouri shore, and heavy timber on the Illinois side, and the channel was down the Missouri shore at that place, so we weren't afraid of anybody running across us. We laid there all day, and watched the rafts and steamboats spin down the Missouri shore, and upbound steamboats fought the big river in the middle. I told Jim all about the time I had jabbering with that woman, and Jim said she was a smart one, and if she was to start after us herself, she wouldn't set down and watch a campfire. No, sir, she'd fetch a dog. Well, then, I said, why couldn't she tell her husband to fetch a dog? Jim said he bet she did think of it by the time the men were ready to start, and he believed they must have gone up town to get a dog, and so they lost all that time, or else we wouldn't be here on the towhead sixteen or seventeen miles below the village. No, indeedy, we would be in that same old town again. So I said I didn't care what was the reason they didn't get us, as long as they didn't. When it was beginning to come on dark, we poked our heads out of the cottonwood thicket, and looked up and down and across. Nothing in sight. So Jim took up some of the top planks of the raft and built a snug wigwam to get under in blazing weather and rainy, and to keep the things dry. Jim made a floor for the wigwam, and raised it a foot or more above the level of the raft, so now the blankets and all the traps was out of reach of steamboat waves. Right in the middle of the wigwam we made a layer of dirt, about five or six inches deep, with a frame around it for to hold it to its place. This was to build a fire on in sloppy weather or chilly. The wigwam would keep it from being seen. We made an extra steering oar, too, because one of the others might get broke on a snag or something. We fixed up a short forked stick to hold the old lantern on, because we must always light the lantern whenever we see a steamboat coming downstream, to keep from getting run over. But we wouldn't have to light it for upstream boats, unless we see we was in what they call a crossing, for the river was pretty high yet, very low banks being still a little under water, so upbound boats didn't always run the channel, but hunted easy water. This second night we run between seven and eight hours, with a current that was making over four mile an hour. We catched fish and talked, and we took a swim now and then to keep off sleepiness. It was kind of solemn, drifting down the big, still river, laying on our backs looking up at the stars, and we didn't ever feel like talking loud and it warn't often that we laughed, only a little kind of a low chuckle. We had mighty good weather as a general thing, and nothing ever happened to us at all, that night, nor the next, nor the next. Every night we passed towns, some of them away up on black hillsides, nothing but just a shiny bed of lights, not a house could you see. The fifth night we passed St. Louis and it was like the whole world lit up. In St. Petersburg they used to say there was twenty or thirty thousand people in St. Louis, but I never believed it till I see that wonderful spread of lights at two o'clock that was still night. There weren't a sound there. Everybody was asleep. 
Every night now I used to slip ashore towards ten o'clock at some little village, and buy ten or fifteen cents worth of meal or bacon or other stuff to eat. Sometimes I lifted a chicken that weren't roost and comfortable, took him along. Pap always said, Take a chicken when you get a chance, because if you don't want him yourself, you can easy find somebody that does, and a good deed ain't ever forgot. I never see Pap when he didn't want the chicken hisself, but that is what he used to say, anyway. Mornings before daylight I slipped into cornfields and borrowed a watermelon, or a mushmelon, or a pumpkin, or some new corn, or things of that kind. Pap always said it wa'n't no harm to borrow things if he was meaning to pay them back some time, but the widow said it warn't anything but a soft name for stealing, and no decent body would do it. Jim said he reckoned the widow was partly right, and Pap was partly right, so the best way would be for us to pick out two or three things from the list and say we wouldn't borrow them any more. Then he reckoned it wouldn't be no harm to borrow the others. So we talked it over all one night, drifting along down the river, trying to make up our minds whether to drop the watermelons, or the cantaloupes, or the mushmelons, or what. But towards daylight we got it all settled satisfactory, and concluded to drop crab-apples and persimmons. We weren't feeling just right before that, but it was all comfortable now. I was glad the way it come out, too, because crab-apples ain't ever good, and the persimmons wouldn't be ripe for two or three months yet. We shot a waterfowl now and then, that got up too early in the morning, or didn't go to bed early enough in the evening. Take it all around, we lived pretty high. The fifth night below St. Louis we had a big storm after midnight, with a power of thunder and lightning and the rain poured down in a solid sheet. We stayed in the wigwam and let the raft take care of itself. When the lightning glared out we could see a big straight river ahead, and high rocky bluffs on both sides. By and by, says I, Hello, Jim, looky yonder! It was a steamboat that had killed herself on a rock. We was drifting straight down for her. The lightning showed her very distinct. She was leaning over, with part of her upper deck above water, and you could see every little chimbley guy clean and clear, and a chair by the big bell, with an old slouch hack hanging on the back of it, when the flashes come. Well, it being away in the night and stormy, and all so mysterious-like, I felt just the way any other boy would have felt when I see that wreck laying there so mournful and lonesome in the middle of the river. I wanted to get aboard of her and slink around a little and see what there was there. So I says, Let's land on her, Jim. But Jim was dead against it at first. He says, I don't want to go fool around no rack. We're doing blame well, and we better let blame well alone, as the good book says. Like as not, there's a watchman on that wreck. Watchman, your grandmother... I says, there ain't nothing to watch but the Texas and the pilot house, and do you reckon anybody's going to risk his life for a Texas and a pilot house on such a night as this, when it's likely to break up and wash down the river any minute? Jim couldn't say nothing to that, so he didn't try. And besides, I says, we might borrow something worth having out of the captain's stateroom. Cigars, I bet you and cost five cents apiece solid cash. Steamboat captains is always rich, and get sixty dollars a month, and they don't care a cent what a thing costs, you know, long as they want it. Stick a candle in your pocket? I can't rest, Jim, till we give her a rummaging. Do you reckon Tom Sawyer would ever go buy this thing? Not for pie, he wouldn't. He'd call it an adventure, that's what he'd call it, and he'd land on that wreck, if it was his last act. And wouldn't he throw style into it? Wouldn't he spread hisself, nor nothing? Why, you think it was Christopher Columbus discovering kingdom come. I wish Tom Sawyer was here. Jim, he grumbled a little, but give in. He said we mustn't talk any more than we could help, 
and then talk mighty low. The lightning showed us the wreck again just in time, and we fetched the stabbard derrick, and made fast there. The deck was high out here. We went sneaking down the slope of it to larboard, in the dark, towards the Texas, feeling our way slow with our feet, and spreading our hands out to fend off the guys, for it was so dark we couldn't see no sign of them. Pretty soon we struck the forward end of the skylight, and clumb on to it, and the next step fetched us in front of the captain's door, which was open, and by Jiminy, away down through the Texas hall we see a light, and all in the same second we seemed to hear low voices in yonder. Jim whispered, and said he was feeling powerful sick, and told me to come along. I says, all right, and was going to start for the raft, but just then I heard a voice wail out and say, Oh, please don't, boys, I swear I won't ever tell. Another voice said pretty loud, That's a lie, Jim Turner. You've acted this way before. You always want more than your share of the truck, and you've always got it, too, because you've swore if you didn't you'd tell. But this time you said it just one time too many. You're the meanest, treacherousest hound in this country. By this time Jim was gone for the raft. I was just a bilin' with curiosity, and I says to myself, Tom Sawyer wouldn't back out now, and so I won't either. I'm a-going to see what's going on here. So I dropped on my hands and knees in the little passage, and crept aft in the dark till there weren't but one stateroom betwixt me and the cross hall of the Texas. Then in there I see a man stretched on the floor and tied hand and foot, and two men standing over him, and one of them had a dim lantern in his hand, and the other one had a pistol. This one kept pointing the pistol at the man's head on the floor and saying, I'd like to, and I order to, a mean skunk. The man on the floor would shrivel up and say, Oh, please don't, Bill, I ain't ever going to tell and every time he said that the man with the lantern would laugh and say, "'Deed you ain't. You never said no truer thing than that. You bet ye.' And once he said, "'Hear him beg, and yet if we hadn't got the best of him and tied him, he'd have killed us both. And what for? Just for nothing. Just because we stood on our rights. That's what for. But I lay you ain't going to threaten nobody any more, Jim Turner.' Put up that pistol, Bill. Bill says, I don't want to, Jake Packard. I'm a for killing him. And didn't he kill old Hatfield just the same way? And don't he deserve it? But I don't want him killed, and I got my reasons for it. Bless your heart for them words, Jake Packard. I never forget you long as I live, says the man on the floor, sort of blubbering. Packer didn't take no notice of that, but hung up his lantern on a nail, and started towards where I was, there in the dark, and motioned Bill to come. I crawfished as fast as I could about two yards, but the boat slanted so I couldn't make very good time, so to keep from getting run over and catched, I crawled into a stateroom on the upper side. The man came a-pawing along in the dark, and when Packer got to my stateroom he says, here, come in here. And in he come, and Bill after him. But before they got in, I was up in the upper berth, cornered, and sorry I come. Then they stood there, with their hands on the ledge of the berth, and talked. I couldn't see them, but I could tell where they was by the whiskey they'd been having. I was glad I didn't drink whiskey, but it wouldn't have made much difference anyway because most of the time they couldn't have treated me because I didn't breathe. I was too scared. And besides, a body couldn't breathe and hear such talk. They talked low and earnest. Bill wanted to kill Turner. He says, He said he'll tell, and he will. If we was to give both our shares to him now, it wouldn't make no difference after the row and the way we've served him. Sure's you're born. He'll turn state's evidence. Now you hear me. I'm for putting him out of his troubles. So am I. 
says Packard very quiet. Blame it, I'd sort of begun to think you wasn't. Well, then, that's all right. Let's go and do it. Hold on a minute. I hain't had my say yet. You listen to me. Shootin's good, but there's quieter ways of the things got to be done. But what I say is this. It ain't good sense to go courtin' round after a halter if you can get at what you're up to in some way that's just as good and at the same time don't bring you into no risks. Ain't that so? You bet it is. But how you going to manage it this time? Well, my idea is this. We'll rustle round, gather up whatever pickings we've overlooked in the staterooms, and shove for shore and hide the truck. Then we'll wait. Now I say it ain't going to be more than two hours before this wreck breaks up and washes off down the river. See? He'll be drowned, and won't have nobody to blame for it but his own self. I reckon that's a considerable sight better than killing of him. I'm unfavorable to killing a man as long as you can get round it. It ain't good sense. It ain't good morals. Ain't I right? Yes, I reckon you are. But suppose she don't break up and wash off. Well, we can wait the two hours anyway and see, can't we? All right, then. Come along. So they started, and I lit out, all in a cold sweat, and scrambled forward. It was dark as pitch there, but I said in a kind of coarse whisper, Jim, and he answered up right at my elbow with a sort of a moan, and I says, Quick, Jim, it ain't no time for fooling around and moaning. There's a gang of murderers in yonder, and if we don't hunt up their boat and set her drifting down the river so these fellows can't get away from the wreck, there's one of em going to be in a bad fix, and if we find their boat we can put all of em in a bad fix, for the sheriff will get em. Quick, hurry! I'll hunt the labboard side, you hunt the starboard. You start at the raft and— Oh, my lordy, lordy, raft! There ain't no raft no more. She done broke loose and gone. I... Oh, and here we is! End of chapter